This is going to be Psalms 19 about why I love the words. In the first part of chapter 19, you have the Lord showing you that His Word and His existence is shown in creation. And that reminds me of Romans 1.20, which says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the invisible things of Him are seen in the creation, giving you no excuse. You don't have an excuse to deny His existence. So the words spoken by the creation show you firsthand that the Word is powerful because God used His words to speak it into existence. And that's the first reason why I love the words, because they're powerful words. Psalms 19.1 To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. The firmament shows the work of God's hands. And if you don't know what that is, then you can go outside in the day and see the first heaven. And that shows you the clouds and birds flying. You can go out at night and you see further into His creation. You see the moon and the stars. That's the second heaven. As you noticed, it said the heavens declare the glory of God. So how does the moon... And stars just hang up there by themselves. How did it all get here on its own? How does the sun just rise and set every day like clockwork? Because this is God showing you that He is Creator. And He used His words to make it. These are powerful words. That's why I love the words. The heavens declare the glory of God. They are saying something. They declare the glory of God. Just like your grandma used to say, Well, I declare... Just like the old timers you say, well, I declare, the heavens declare the glory of God. Psalms 19, 2 and 3. Day and unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Every person from the most ignorant tribe or people in the world can go outside of their hut and look up and know that there is a God. Anyone can go out of their house and see the creation. Even the natural disasters that take place, this points to God. You have access to a powerful creator. He has left you access in this country to the words of God 24-7. These are powerful words. There is no speech nor language or their voice is not heard. It doesn't need a translator. It doesn't need the translator app on the iPhone to tell you something. It can speak to anybody, no matter how big, little, smart, ignorant they may be. Psalms 19.4, their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. So their line is gone out through all the earth. What's that? It's like he gave him a line. You know that common saying, he gave them a line, meaning he said something or a pickup line or a punch line. A line is something someone said. So their line is what the heavens say to all the earth, speaking a language everyone can understand. And the words go to the end of the world. And in them, in the heavens, is a tabernacle for the sun. The words are powerful. That's why I love the words. They're powerful. And I also love the words because they're prophetic. They tell me what's going to happen in the future. When I was a kid, there was a show that came on where... Every day this man would open his door and on his front doorstep he would have a newspaper telling him what was going to happen that day and he would go out and save people because he knew all the disasters that were coming. And he could go out and save people. You've got that. It's, it's in your house. If you've got a King James Bible, you've got something that's telling you the future, telling you what's going to happen. I love the words because they're prophetic words. They tell the future. And if you've been listening to these psalm studies, then you know... The Bible is prophetic words. I like prophetic words because I like to know what's coming. I don't want it to take me by surprise. So you have a prophecy in Psalms 19 and verse 5. And it says, Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. So the Lord Jesus Christ is, as you know, the bridegroom. And if you didn't know that, just see Mark 2.20, Luke 5.34, Matthew 25.10. The verse says, which is as a bridegroom. What's as a bridegroom? Well, look at verse 4. The son is as a bridegroom. 
So uh, Jesus Christ, you see him as the son of righteousness. He's the son of God, and he's the S-U-N of righteousness as well. Malachi 4.2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness, capital S on the S-U-N, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. That's the second coming. And it's the second coming in Psalms 19.5. And in Revelation 1.16 it says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So Psalms 19.5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. So Jesus Christ is the son of righteousness. He is a bridegroom. Soon he's coming out of his chamber at the second coming as a strong man. And he will bind the strong man of this world. Mark 3.27, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then will he spoil his house. So he's coming down to finish running the race. And we need to finish running our race before he gets here. As it talks about in Hebrews 12.1, Let us lay aside, aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It says in Psalms 19.6, His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming, and nothing will be hid from the heat thereof. What is that? That's the fire at the second coming, Joel 2, 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. And yea, and nothing shall escape them. Doesn't that remind you of nothing will be hid from the heat thereof? The people in the lost world at Christ's return will try to hide, but something will, will nothing will be hid from the flames. No one shall escape. First Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Nothing will be hid from the heat thereof. Next, all of the words... Because they're perfect words. They're powerful words. They're prophetic words. And they're perfect words. Psalms 19.7 The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Uh, 2 Samuel 7.28 says, And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. The words are true. They're perfect. They're without error. There's nothing you can do to improve upon them. Revelation 21, 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I'll make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Everything that God ever told anybody to write was right. And nobody has the right to say that they ain't right. And if they do, then they need to get right. The words are right. They're true. They're perfect. If any part of the word was in error, then how do we know all of it isn't in error? To a Bible believer... You have to believe every word and never change it. And if you can change it, then who says, I, I can't change it? And then someone else, why can't they change it? If, if you can change it. And then who's the final authority? You become the final authority. But the final authority has to be the Bible. And there's only one Bible. All the rest have been changed according to what someone else's opinion was, what they think God said, and what they think he didn't say. I love the words because they're perfect words. When everybody sits on a throne of lies, his word is still true. When your day is bad and you feel like the world is against you, and it really is, the Bible is still sitting there with truer words than have ever been spoken. But next, I love the words because they're purifying words. Psalms 19.8, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes and that's why psalms 4 8 says finally brethren whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there be any virtue if there be any praise think on these things the words are purifying and it says to 
think on whatsoever is pure in Philippians 4 8. If you sit around and think about Netflix original series and Lifetime movies and HBO, then you're not going to be pure. But the commandment of the Lord is pure. The statutes of the Lord are right. They aren't to the left like Joe Biden and Harris and people like that. They are right. They're pure. Clinging, uh, clinging to the promises in Scripture and thinking on those things will make you pure. The hope of the rapture, for example. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Beloved, now we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Some people, after they get saved, still have their minds corrupted so bad that they can't think straight. But the word can purify you, can transform you. Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's purifying words. Psalms 19, 9, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So the word makes you clean. It makes you pure. The world pushes you away from the fear of God to the fear of man. But the fear of the Lord is clean. Proverbs 16, 6, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged. but And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. You get the fear of the Lord by reading the Bible. The fear of the Lord makes you depart from evil. The word is purifying. It's a purifying word. The word is what warns you of the danger of straying from God. Psalms 19.11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So you're warned by the word, and you're rewarded for keeping the words. The word is prophetic. It tells the future. It lets you know that if you keep the words, then crowns and rewards wait at the judgment seat of Christ for you. Psalms 19.12, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. So what does that mean? Who can understand his errors? Well, you don't have any idea of all the sins you commit in a day. You even need cleansing from secret faults. Not to stay saved, but to stay in fellowship. Christians commit many sins of ignorance. They don't love the words. So there are a lot of sins they haven't even read about in the Bible. Those are their secret faults. Who can understand his errors. Who knows all the bad things that he's got going through his mind? Who knows all the bad things that he's committed during the day? you got to pray about these things. The Word reveals these things to you as you read it as well. In Psalms 19.13, it says, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. The presumptuous sins are ones you knew were wrong, but you went ahead and did them anyway. David says, let not them have dominion over me. The presumptuous sins. You can let them take control when you don't walk in the spirit. You yield your members to the lusts of the flesh. And you don't want to do that. And when you meditate on the things of the world and on the things of God, you're, you're going to have trouble. You're not purifying yourself with the word. Uh, Psalms 19.14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So you want the things that you say and the thoughts that you have to be acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God, who is where your true strength comes from and your salvation comes from. He's your strength. He's your Redeemer. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.5, Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought you have needs to be obedient to the words. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So I love the words because they're purifying. And next, I love the words because they're permanent words. Psalms 19.9, The fear of the Lord is clean, 
enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. But see that the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. It endures forever. It can't go away. The world can't make something that lasts forever. It can't do it. It always degenerates. People like vacation, but it only lasts a while. You can take a picture and it will last longer, but it's not like being there. And the picture fades. They can burn it in a fire and it can be forgotten. But the words of the Lord in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ and your new body, these things endure forever. Psalms 12, 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I like all these P words, pure, purified, preserved. These are permanent, perfect, powerful words. The scripture was around before God even used men to write the words on paper. Genesis 3.8 or Galatians 3 8, and the scripture, notice that, and the scripture foreseen that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. It just said the scripture foreseen, applying life like characteristics to the scripture. And there was no scripture written. When Abraham was alive, God used men to write the words on paper, but the scripture was around before men wrote the words down on paper. They're enduring forever. Next, I love the words because they're pleasing. Psalms 19.10, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The word will please you much more than the things of this world much more than the temporal things. Once you really start reading the Bible, I'm not just talking about your average run-of-the-mill Christian who does not give two cares about the Bible. I'm talking about somebody who really, really got in the Bible. Once they really started reading the Bible and got into it, they found out that nothing could satisfy. The same pleasure in this world that you used to get pleasure off of does not satisfy you anymore. You won't find the same, the, the same kind of pleasure in that pleasure that you used to find because you know that the Word is what's permanent, is what's pure, it's what's pleasing, it's what's powerful. The things of this world are temporary. The words are more to be desired than gold. Do you desire the words when you wake up in the morning? Is it the first thing on your mind? When you read the Bible, study the Bible, meditate on the words, is it like a, a, a good meal? That feeling you, you had after you just had a good meal. Probably the first thing on your mind in the morning is what pleases you the most. The last thing on your mind when you lay down is what you're thinking about the most. What you dream about is probably what you're thinking about the most. A lot of Christians are good moral people and they go to church three times a week, but they never got a desire for the word. They cheat their self out of a lifelong journey of searching the scriptures. They miss the joy of having a wide margin Bible that they could fill up with commentary and references. They miss the joy of finding the deep and secret things of the word. They miss the joy of finding a new nugget that God shows you every single day that you get in the word. Just a new nugget of that you didn't even know was there. You find it out of nowhere. These things come along with loving the words, but people cheat themselves out of the words because they have their mind on the temporal things. Psalms 19.11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Are you going to keep the words? Are you going to read the words, study the words, meditate on the words? If so, you're going to have great reward in heaven. I believe People who stay in the book are going to have great rewards when they get to the judgment seat of Christ. So do you love the words?